All right, guys, we are back for this next episode of Beyond the Skills podcast, where we talk everything business, real estate, sex, drugs, rock and roll, Marine Corps. I think that is the Marine Corps. (laughs) (laughs) Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's it, brother. Yeah. So we uh, are pumped to have Mr. Austin Hancock came in from San Diego, California. Yes, sir. Um, Real estate investor. Marine, badass tattoos, built like a freaking tank. <laughs> Thanks, man. Real estate contractor, investor. Um, tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for having me out, dude. An awesome house. Uh, great connecting with other real estate investors and like-minded people, which I think we can get into a lot of that today. Yep. Um, and so my story starts, I mean, I, I grew up in Edmond, Oklahoma. It's a suburb of Oklahoma City. I was a pretty, you know, traditional growing up. I mean, I, I mean, it was a middle class kid going to a public school system, riding my bike, having friends, sleepovers, playing Nintendo 64, uh, ramping over each other when we build dirt jumps, you know, playing paintball in the woods. You typical know, American kid. Typical American kid at the time, you know, I mean, getting in little scuffs with your buddies, you know, that was kind of thing. So I, I would have to say I grew up pretty good. I can't I have nothing to complain about. My parents are hard workers, I'm very disciplined Christian people. Um, I grew up with a pretty conservative background, you know, going to church on Sundays, you know, dad um, got transferred to Oklahoma and then he started his own business once he got transferred. And so he's an entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. And so I kind of don't know any other different, any different. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I grew up pretty chill, you know, up until about 17 years old and 16 years old when I started to test the limits of, of, uh, I when guess you, when the, your testosterone test kicked the in. limits of my life. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, mom and dad don't know anything. You know everything at 17, and so that's yep. how it starts. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming you, you, you probably have the mindset of most young entrepreneurs that we don't know, you know, when we're young, but when we get older, we kind of reflect, well, that's, that kind of makes sense. I'm an entrepreneur now. It's wild and crazy. Now, yeah. Yeah, it makes yep. a lot of sense, huh? Yeah, 100%. Tell, tell us what kind of kid you were. So, I mean, I was a great kid growing up, played sports, did all the things like I just talked about. But what happened was when I got a little bit of puberty, like you said, and yep. started drinking and having a little fun, testing the limits. You know, my parents being that they were more conservative people, I felt like I needed to, how do they know if this is bad or good or whatever? Mm-hmm. And so I think that's just common with young yep. men to kind of test, you know, the, the growing up that you've had to, to see, to carve your own path, to see if that's accurate or not. Uh, mom and dad know best or if they know best for me. Um, and so I did essentially, boom, I, uh, I'd, I got in a lot of fights, a lot of parties, a lot of parties and alcohol and young and testosterone all tends to be fights. So a few little scuffles here and there. And then one specific event was about to wreck my life. I mean, I had two felonies and two misdemeanors at 17 years old. And, um, I was, I was just looking down the system at doing juvenile delinquent time because I was a youthful offender at 17. This is Oklahoma City, right? Yeah, this is Oklahoma City. I went to county. And so I got, essentially, the long story short is that I I was at a party. Some guy, just a house party, you know, classic. What I notice now, though, is a lot of people don't have as many house parties as our generation did, though. You know what I'm saying? That's like right. they're like They're a lot more chill, I think. I think maybe it's for the best, but alcohol was a big thing. Field parties were a big thing. Bonfires. That's all you did. You know why? It's because we didn't have a bunch of Instagram and stuff. Yeah. So you had to test the limits of the world. Yeah. That was, and that was good times, you know, bonfires. You, know. you learn a lot what to do, what not to do. That's exactly right. So you uh, got in some trouble at 17, yeah. uh, got in some fights, got, got, got arrested. Um, what, when was that transition? It was like, hey, look, um, I want to be a, a commando. I want to yeah. I want to be a, you know, a military guy. Sure. So I wanted to grow it up. I mean, I was playing, you know, playing guns with sticks, playing paintball. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, I always had all the Navy SEAL books. I was, we, we joked about it earlier. I mean, the truck, you know, I watched all the movies. We're talking Rambo, First Blood, Terminator to, you know, Commando, the movie, Predator. all of it. It's what we grew up with. I mean, I was, we were, I was kind of on the back end. You're a little older than me, but I was kind of on the back end of the GI Joe era. I mean, yep. you got to think, you That's, know, Team up, America yeah. jacked up, you know, all the action figures. Yeah. So I was like, I want to do that. You yeah. know, I want to be like that. So it was always in my head. It was always a concept that I was like, dude, that's what's up. I want to test myself, and that's the way to do it. Um, but this, this situation that I was in was going to ruin that. I mean, just completely obliterate it. And I don't think I knew the magnitude of the situation at the time. I knew it was bad. This is bad. But I look back upon it, and I'm like, oh, it was a, definitely a fork in the road for me in my life. 
Like it could have gone down that road of going to juvenile delinquent center uh, and then, you know, getting in more fights there because you're yeah. going to get tested. You're going to be in a bunch of group of people that aren't, aren't doing the best for themselves um, and struggling. And so yeah. the Marine Corps was the best place for me. And I got some good advice from a guy I was working with. At the time, I was trim carpentering houses for my dad. I mean, I was building some houses at the time. At and 17, 18, you, you I were was doing trim, I was doing trim. So I was like work. the, essentially the, I don't know what you say, the, the bitch, right? You yep. take the, you, cut this, go there, cut this, go yep. there, pin the closet, do the things like that. Yep. Cut closet rods, mm-hmm. anything like that. Yep. And so I was, I was learning about trim carpentry, working all summer. And the guy that told me, he's like, dude, you ought to join the Marine Corps. And I'd always wanted to like, in my mind, I was like, I'm going to be an army ranger. I'm going to jump out of planes. I'm going to do this commando shit. And I was like, I never knew, I knew about the Marine Corps. So I started to do a little research wow, that's pretty cool. Like, that's a cool brotherhood. That seems legit. That seems badass. Like, every single one that was a Marine, it's like, it seemed like separate. It's mm-hmm. like, the Marine Corps is over here. All the other branches are over here, you know? And I was like, okay. And so I started talking to the recruiter. Recruiter was awesome. The recruiter that I talked to, I'm like, here's the deal, dude. I got two felonies and two misdemeanors. And this is 2006. So for those watching, you know, in 2006, obviously the war in Iraq was going on. Afghanistan, I don't think, was that heavy. Iraq was the hot spot. And uh, what year was the Fallujah? The Fallujah was 04. 04, 04 and 05 was Ramadi, 04, 05 ish. And so that was real hot. And so I graduated high school in 05. And the, I, I technically, the charges were brought against me in 05. I was a senior. So I was wow. still in school. Wow. Yeah, I was still a senior. So it was one of those weekender parties. Then you go back to high school. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story about that. And then we'll get back to it. But I, I, I had essentially I hit somebody over the head with a tire iron in a house that wasn't mine. So I got the burglary one charge for hitting, for walking into the premises. It wasn't mine. I didn't steal anything. And I got the assault with a deadly weapon charge for hitting the dude over the head that jumped me. So I was essentially coming back and defending myself. I don't have any, I'm not excusing the situation by all means as an adult now, but that's what I did. I got jumped, came back, hit him over the head. Somewhere else. At the party. Yeah, he he kicked me, basically jumped me and my buddy. Two of them jumped me and my buddy. We left, we come back with tire irons and, you know, get our payback in our mind. You know, so uh, that didn't pan out for the best, <laughs> but for him or me, I guess either. Yep. Uh, so anyways, I go back, I, I, all this shit happens. I go to county jail, boom, my parents get me out. I get on bail um, and then I got to go back to school right the next week. And then the rumors started going around because I had a bunch of people at that party were college kids. And then I was a senior and then some of my high school friends. And then and I remember just the, the reality really ch- uh, set in when the rumors started going around because Think about it. I hit the dude over the head. He, I bush, uh, gut, blood is just gushing from his head. Boom. We get into a more of a scrap. And then the police were at the door. Like somebody had already been calling them. So the, I, I leave the house with guns drawn on me, get thrown in the front lawn, then put in the cop car, go to Edmond, then go to county. I say all that because when I went back to school, the rumors were flying around that I killed the guy. And that, and that really, you don't know. And I was like, oh, oh shit. boy. Yeah, that's when it kind of really hit. Yeah. You know, I was like, this, I knew it was dumb. I knew this, I shouldn't have done this. I woke up, you know, sobered up, things like that. And then you're like, oh, that could have been real bad. Yeah. Like there was no Marine Corps chance anymore if that was going to happen. There's no nothing chance anymore. You know, you could get a homicide for how long is your charges in your case. Your, your life is over from one stupid mistake yeah. and one stupid night. Was that the, the catapult that said, hey, I want to, I need to get right and straighten up my yeah. life? Yeah, it was. But I had a lot of pushback from my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents wanted me to go. Their thoughts in their mind at the time was, being Christian folks, they're like, we're, you're going to go to a Christian college. We're going to pay for it. You need to get yourself right. You need to go down this route. You need to get, meet a Christian girl. You know, they, they didn't live a very radical life. So their minds, I'm like, I'm, they have some siblings that have. And yeah. so, and their siblings have served time. You're a rebel. They're so, yeah, you're done. Black sheep. This yep. could be the worst, you know. And uh, anyways, I remember just somebody being like, oh, you killed the guy, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like researching it. You know, we didn't have iPhones or anything at that time. I'm having to figure out. I'm calling my attorneys and figuring it out. Uh, fortunately, I didn't. Uh, and, and, and what happened was I, I reached out to the recruiter. The recruiter's like, all right, we can work with it. We'll figure it out. At that time, they're doing waivers for things because if, if anybody watching this remembers, they were doing a big push in Iraq. So George W. Bush had this whole surge thing going on. That was what they were doing on the news. They were like, surge, troops, we only had 50,000 there. We're going to push 300,000 out. So the Marine Corps and the Army and every branch known to man was bringing as much people in as possible. You know, is that they were just trying to flood the military. And so if you had a hand tattoos at the time, if you had oh, smoked weed, and you popped on a piss test, you could still freaking get away. They would look past in. it. They'll look past it. 
because they're going to send you right over. Yeah. So they needed the bodies. Yeah. And uh, so uh, that I was fortunate <laughs> that worked out for me as like old school, you know, small town kind of mentality. I go to my recruiter. My recruiter's like, yeah, I'll go to bat for you. He gets with my attorney. Long story short, they go to the judge with my recruiter, my attorney, the judge, me. And they're like, all right, if Hancock's going to enlist uh, and then the United States Marine Corps is going to go off there, we were going to send him to juvie anyway for six months minimum. Uh, this is probably a better route so you, for the young man. You were able to trade out? Yeah, essentially so my attorney going, negotiated that. So if you didn't go to the Marine Corps, you were going, going to juvie? I was going to juvie, yeah. Yeah, yeah 100%. They, they, they wanted to make a... a, a I wanted to make a, uh, a lesson mm-hmm. out of it because I had a group of friends that were with me when we came back to that house and I kind of led the pack on that. So they were like, oh, he wants to, you know, yeah. have people follow him to do bad things Then he needs to learn a lesson. So you go to boot camp. You, you went to California boot camp? Yeah, I went to MCRD, Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego. Yeah, San Diego. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, how long is the boot camp? Boot camp is 13 weeks. The Crucible. Yeah. Yeah, the Marine Corps Crucible. Yeah. Yep. yep. So you got through that. I'm assuming that was pretty tough mentally. It was, it was awesome. It was the best thing for me. So like when I joined, I mean, it was, it was what I needed. Uh, I didn't know, but I, 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 what's funny is I never really traveled much as a young man. So, I mean, I had a pretty good growing up, like you said, a uh, pretty conservative family. And then now, boom, I'm shipped off living in, you know, a, a room in the barracks with 70 other dudes and the, my whole platoon, 70 units times, you know, multiple other units. And then these drill instructors and stuff, and it was exactly what I what I needed. Yeah. yeah. So you go to boot camp, and then they start straightening you up, and you know, lots of discipline, lots order. of discipline. Oh yeah, lots of mayhem and chaos. Essentially, they're just trying to put you under pressure and see if you'll crack. You'll crack. Yeah, you can't do anything right in boot camp. This yeah. is kind of a game. And you can't quit, can you? Technically, you can't you can't quit, but people do med step out. So people do like psychological evaluations, and, mm-hmm. and some of the drill instructors. And now that I'm friends with some of my drill instructors. Um, from the time they, th- he told me straight up, they're like, our objective was to push those people out because we knew that they were going to be a liability because yeah. you guys were going to combat. Yeah. And so they take their job very serious because yeah. some of these guys are, like I said to you privately without the camera, I was like, these guys are like 25, 26 yeah. year old drill instructors. And a lot of them had just been in, in Fallujah. My senior drill instructor was part of the unit that was uh, in Haditha, which ended up being where I was deployed. But there was, if you can Google it, it's called the Haditha Massacre. And it was a situation where Marines wasted some civilians, hypothetically speaking, supposedly. And they took a hard point, which is the house. Um, and it was just real controversial. And so it was a big trial going on with it. And my senior drill instructor would have to leave our, his, his drill field to go up to Pendleton to do trial stuff with JAG. And so a lot of these, what I'm getting at, though, is these guys that were drill instructors at this time period, this 2006, 2007, 2008, and up, yeah, they were, they were, they were going to put you through the ringer because they know that you were going to see some shit. Like, you, 99% chance you're going to combat, whether you're a Motor T guy, a, a chef, or an infantryman. And so they made it, it took, I think they took it pretty personal that they're like, yeah. we wouldn't want this guy in our unit because yeah. we were just there. I'm going to crush them. Yep. And so they would crush these pussies and uh, these weak little boys. Yep. And, and, and I mean, I remember they would make these guys, these guys would do anything they could to try to get out. They're they'd safe. be, they'd they're be safe. trying to shit their pants. They'd be crying to their mom. They'd be trying to commit suicide. I mean, I had a dude, it's the freaking first day, it's called Black Friday. I had a dude jump out of the third story deck. So the barracks is three stories high. The, the, and everybody is all in this, let's, this whole barracks right here, this whole column, they're called H's. The very top level, this dude tries to kill himself by jumping through the fucking glass window and lands on his face right in front of me while we're carrying our foot lockers in and out because the drill instructor's making us go in and out. He's like, oh, in and out, get out of the house, you know, just yelling at us, causing chaos. Everybody's getting fucked up. Uh, and that's what they're just trying to do, trying to cause mayhem. And they're just yelling at you, spitting on you, pushing you down, and uh, just complete chaos, getting you adapted to chaos. Mm. How are you going to handle chaos? Because war is chaos. And so this dude, I remember carrying my foot locker out, and I'm just, you know, walking, and then I see this guy fly out of the freaking top deck but he lands right in front of me. And I remember my drill instructor being like, good, I hope he dies. And I was like, oh my God, we're fucked. <laughs> like, this is how it's going to be. Like, you know, this 25 year old guy just got back in combat. He don't give a fuck about this pussy that jumped out of here. He doesn't, like, literally doesn't. Yeah. One of my drill instructors, like six foot five, he had a 249 machine gun on his forearm. The other one had a, blue, a purple heart that he was, he was in Fallujah. You know, they just. He's a liability. He's a liability. It's like, yeah. good. He literally, it's like, you could, it was like no reaction. Just good. Fuck him. So you got and then they call the corpsman, of course, and the corpsman takes him off. But like what I'm saying is they're just trying to break people yeah. and get them out. So you got liabilities and assets. It's, 
in, in war, just like you got in real estate and business. Yep. And, and that's why I love bringing guys like you on who are ex-military, who have become entrepreneurs and business guys, because there's so many characteristics and similarities for the audience to hear because it's relatable. I mean, dude, you can't be a pussy no. and go to the military. Man, there are some guys that squeak through. Like we call it the 10%. Like there really are. Sometimes they're guys, they'll just be a guy that squeaks through. Yep. Like there's all, there always is, right? Like high level business people. There's always this 10% that squeaks through. And those dudes are the guys you got to still watch out for, whether you're doing business deals, whether you're doing real estate, whether you're doing, you know, you're yeah, in combat. Shit. Like there's still a Navy SEAL. If, the, if you look at the top tier guys, like Delta operators or, or uh, special forces dudes, and you ranked them, there's still going to be a bottom 10% of the dude that's just getting by that made the qual, you know? Yeah. So that guy can be, become a liability. Yeah. Yep. So you went through boot camp, made it, you get shipped to Iraq. Yeah, so what you do is you go from boot camp, I go home for 10 days, come back, I go to school of infantry, I go to school of infantry, uh, did my, I think it's uh, about two and a half months, you do infantry training, you learn land navigation, you learn machine gun disassembly and assembly, you learn all of the basics of an infantry treatment. You learn how to take apart mach- every weapon system that you're going to be working with, things like that. Like, and it's like school, like you're learning these details, learning how to shoot uh, javelin missiles, because I was a, a tow gunner, learning how to shoot tow missiles, learning how to shoot Mark 19 grenade launchers, all the stuff that you're going to need to use, this is the basics for that. Boot camp is just a qualification phase. It's yeah. just like a hazing, essentially. Yeah. And they yeah. like to teach you how to get your uniform, teach you how to do your hair, teach you how to do this. The next school you go to is like really what teaches you how to do your skill. Mm-hmm. And so you do that. I go to school of infantry. And you got to be skilled to be in the military. 100%. You need you skills. You got to learn a skill. Everybody has their role. Everybody has their job. And kind of like I said earlier, like the Marine Corps is a little different because essentially you have the infantry and then you have all the supporting elements around it. And yeah. So, I mean, our, the Marine Corps has one job. It's not... Yeah. We're not an occupational force like the army. We're not uh, doing stuff like that. So yeah. our job is to be the infantry Marine yeah. Corps and then everything around it is a supporting element. Even air, air is supporting for the yeah. infantry, for the ground movements. Y'all are put in the shit to clean out the shit. And everybody yeah, we're else there comes. first. Yeah, yeah, for most of the time. You're, you're, you're first tip of the spear. When it, when it comes to total military, yes, right? Like special operations gets plugged in here and plugged in there and they're yeah. always they're doing They're more something. surgery. They're surgery, yes. We are the front of the front lines. Yeah. Yep, 100%. Yep. So you went to Iraq, you spent a year there. Um, tell us what that experience was. Yes, sir. So I was in, two, I was in Iraq 2007 and 2008, um, the crossover through that. Um, and I, I honestly, like I said to you before, I, I enjoyed doing that more. I enjoyed being in the combat zone and doing my job. I loved being on the field. If you want to analyze it and like, you know, like sports, yep. I like doing our job. It felt so much better. Yeah. It felt like here we are. It's, it's serious. It's easier to take serious yeah. when it's real. And so, you know, um, you have a real reason yeah. to do the standard operating procedures. You have a real reason because otherwise you're just training for it. And you're like, ah, yeah. So, you, so it seems to me just listening to you, it was pretty seamless for you to, in the military. It made a lot of sense for your personality, who you were. It yeah. seemed like you really enjoyed it. There's um, definitely shit times. Like sure. I, you only remember the good times. Like sure. I've been, I've been far removed now. I'm 37 and I got yeah. out at like 21, 22. Yeah. So, but, and, and I joke about that because every Marine, you know, especially the Marines, I feel we're like always Marines. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And, and I still will carry that to this day, but we, sometimes we forget about the, the shitty times and the only shitty times really there are, is just dealing with other people. People get a little egotistical with rank, um, unqualified, higher command, um, things like that. The, the 10% may have enlisted, you know, five Un- years before you, but Un- now he's your staff sergeant. Say that again, unqualified what? Um, unqualified leadership. That sounds like influencers in the real estate space. Real estate. <laughs> it, it is. is. It that's, is the that's same. That's what that sounds like. Yeah, too. 100%. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> it is. And think about it. It's like the... It's like the guy that all he did, he's the bare minimum, but now he's been in longer than you, born before you, and he has rank above you, and then you know they're not qualified. Correct. But you've just been here before us. Yeah. So, so now he gets to tell you what to do, and then the thing, the difference is when you are in a combat zone, it's your life on the line. Yeah. And so you have to be very careful. So we've all watched the war movies where the platoon essentially gets together and is like, fuck you, we're not listening to you, Staff Sergeant, or whatever, mm-hmm. when he's leading them down the bad path. Um, and so that happens. That yep. does happen. It's not common, but it does happen. So you put in the year. What does that look like coming back to civilian life? 20, yeah, so I come back. 20, um, I was reserved, so I come back, and then I start back to my civilian job. 23 I, this, this time? Is, uh, 20, this is 2009. How old are you? 2000. I, I am, no, I'm uh, 19 years old. When you come back? Yeah, yeah. So I got in the Marine Corps at 18, uh, 19. I'm 20 years old. I'm 20. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I got out of the Marine Corps at 21. 
Wow. Like my final papers were at 21, 22 years old. Okay. So you come back to civilian life after. So when you get back from Iraq, were you still in the Marines or you were done? Uh, no, I was still in the Marines. So okay. I went to reserve time. So I was reservist. So I okay. would go one week in a month to the training facility, check mm-hmm. in, do our thing. And then I would do two weeks a summer. And then some, we did some other deployments that I opted in for where we went to uh, Iraq. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. We went to Africa. So yeah. I went to Morocco, Africa, did a joint training operation for about a month with the Moroccan army. Um, we worked with all of them. That was pretty good. Um, I tell people this, that was really good for me from coming back from Iraq because it helped me a lot with like PTSD due to the fact that Morocco, Africa is a Middle Eastern country. They speak Arabic and French um, because they were French colonized at one point Mm -hmm. in the Sahara Desert. And so it it looks a lot like Iraq slash Mexico. And so when I, when we leave Iraq, you know, you're leaving a combat zone. You got kid on all the time when you go outside the wire, you're, you're, you're always thinking about you're in a high stress environment. You're going to get blown up, going to get shot at. What's going to happen. You're, you're alert a hundred percent of the time for the whole time you're there. When you come back home, some guys get out immediately. Some of my buddies got out immediately. They got right out of the Marine Corps. Like your time was up while you were overseas. And now Chris was a Sergeant and he's like, I'm, I'm done. My paperwork's in. You turn your gear in, you check out. Those guys struggle quite a bit because they're immediately going to the transition to civilian world. Yeah. They're going from that to that, and then the, you lose the brotherhood, essentially. Like, yeah. you can keep up with guys through text and phone yeah. calls and Facebook at the time. But, some, a lot of guys, but it's a struggle. But a lot of guys thrive in that environment, and that is who they are. And they yeah. Come, they're it's hard. It's hard to go through that and then come back and then, like, you have a manager that's like, all right, Chris, let's talk about what you were going to write you up for you saying the F word too many times. Right. Like, shit like that. When he's been in the like, combat. On. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, I just did this and that, you know, and yeah. we say the F word all the time. And so yeah. it's just a different world. And I joke around, but we really had a class, we, we called it, when we came back from deployment, called Don't F-Bomb Your Mom. <laughs> because, you, you know, you're, you're in such an environment where, you know, you just, it's, it's F this, F that, do this, do that. It's direct orders. You can be very blunt. People are like, fuck you, Chris. I want to do this. And it's just like a normal conversation <laughs> right now. Right. You're like, get out of, get out of this. It's kind of hostile dude's environment. Think of like the locker room, like times 10. Yeah. That's kind of how it is. That's, it's that's, like, pick up your shit. Why the fuck are you doing this? That's just kind of how you get talked to or you talk to people. Right. Boom, rotate now and say, go get a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That makes man. sense. It's really tough. So you get back, um, you jump straight back into construction. Yeah, I jumped into construction. But what I was going back is this this is for anybody that's a veteran that watches this. It's like my transition going to Morocco helped me because when we went to Morocco, we were just training with them. We're training with the Moroccan army. They speak Arabic, they're very similar in a Middle Eastern way. And then, uh, I, got, I had liberty. I had time off, so I had a weekend there. So me and my boys, my other Marines, we went out and, and during the day off base and went to the beach and got to explore town a little bit with normal civilian gear, which was kind of a good transition for me because uh, it helped me get acclimated. And, and I feel like it broke down some of the barriers of feeling like I was in high stress. You know, it like yeah. dialed it back, if that makes yeah. sense, because I was in a very similar environment, but now I'm not in a threat uh, i don't have an immediate threat yeah, you're constantly in fight or flight mode when you're overseas 100 yeah. percent. yeah but not now i'm in morocco i'm not i'm like i can kind of unplug a little bit and so that was good yeah. for me yeah. and i had a little bit of time still to like talk about it with my guys yeah. and to laugh about the times we were in iraq and so i had some slower progression you know i think something that was huge in world war ii was the fact that the, a lot of the troops got shipped back to the united states on boats and while you get shipped back on the United States on boats, you're all excited to come home to your honeys. You're all excited to write these letters. But you and I can have some conversations and maybe talk about Jerry that got his head blown off next to you two weeks ago. Yeah. And you can kind of digress some of that stuff. And men need that. People, warriors need that. Yeah. And this day and age, and really where it started was since Vietnam, you can get on a plane and you're in Saigon and then you come home and you're in D.C. getting spit on. And those dudes are going to have a massive struggle. And that's what we started to see with the modern era. And so yeah. I just wanted to tell people that from a veteran standpoint about PTSD. Yeah. And it's you real. I mean? It is real. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of, I had a separation anxiety when I got back because I went back to construction. We all split up because we went reserve. Right. And so I had a lot of separation anxiety from the guys I was with. Um, I, I spent my entire year with them. And then there were dudes that like knew everything about me. Good, bad, ugly. I mean, I got all the funny stories, you know? Yeah. And then boom, you're not with them. Like when I remember dro- my parents picking me up from the airport to go back to their house after I'd gotten back to the States, I'd already been here for a couple months. They're driving me back to Edmond, Oklahoma from the Tulsa airport. And I remember like, uh, this will make me emotional. I remember almost cry- crying. I was crying because I really didn't feel connected to my own parents. I felt, I felt like I left my family. 
it, it's really weird because when you go through certain experiences with certain people, that is your family. You have almost yeah. more of a connection at that point in my yeah. life than I had. Like my parents didn't know me anymore. Right. I didn't, oh, what am I going to talk to them about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was home. I mean, yeah. the, how's the dog? That's was right. work the same dad, you know? And so I struggled with that for a little while and it was good to keep in communication. I'm glad I stayed in it long enough to, to kind of slowly unravel that. Yeah. Yeah. I can see how that can be going, building a brotherhood with somebody that you spilling blood with doing hard work, almost dying, all the, 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 the all the things that happen in combat. Yep. So I can see how that can be. You can't, there's no way that your parents can understand that. Especially yeah. dad. Does and it's not, not their fault. No. Not their thing. But yeah. you know, how do you, how do you unravel that? So, uh, but that was tough. Yeah. Yeah. So you get back home, your dad's in construction, you mm -hmm. told me. So you just went full back into in the I business. I just went back and got a job where I got a job. You know, I yeah. grew up in construction. It's where I went since I was almost 13 years old. I'd, I'd go in the summers. My dad would pick me up. We'd go to the job sites my entire life. Yeah. Uh, my, my grandfather ran a dirt work company. So I grew up in equipment. Uh, learned how to weld at a young age. Yeah. Um, like I was telling you guys, I was in trim carpentry. I've done about all facets of construction yeah. because of that. And um, yeah, I just went right, right back to work. Uh, and then I also, so I went to college. I was like, I'm going to go to college now. I'm going to become a firefighter, kind of a paramilitary organization. This makes sense for me. I can work 11 days a month. I can lift weights. I can get jacked. I can kind of do my thing again. And so I did. I, I went through municipal fire safety. Uh, I got my municipal fire safety degree. And I was going through the college thing. And um, I, I got it. I did it. But then I started applying for firefighter jobs. And what was happening now is that the people in the military that I had all deployed with were all getting out. So there was a large wave during 2010, 2011 of people that were coming back from Iraq and the Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps that were getting out. And so Oklahoma City Fire Department would have four openings and there would be 1,100 applicants. And if you didn't score 95 on the test, you didn't even get your application looked at to move to the physical. And I was like, I was banking on my physical. I was like, I can score an 85 on this stupid written test. I've never been good at written tests, but just give me an opportunity on the physical. I'll fucking outperform them. Yeah, because I, I got a first class PFT in boot camp. I actually got promoted to uh, meritoriously in, to PFC. I was the most fit in the boot camp class. And so I was like, I knew I could make up some ground for my old noggin and, uh, and, and do that. But that isn't how it works. They look at the paperwork first. And then they qualify you physically yeah. afterwards. So it was an uphill battle. I kept applying to that. I kept applying. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, it was a $35,000 salary a year. And I'm working my ass off for it. I'm going to school for it. I'm still doing construction. And uh, I just, I'd met, I'd met some buddies at the time. Uh, ones that I'd met before, but got backed up. We got connected with some more guys back from home. Gym buddies, you know, gym buddies. And one of them was like, dude, you know everything about construction? Like he just kind of said it to me. He's like, he, he, this guy was a real estate wholesaler. He did short sales and stuff. Didn't know anything what that was. I didn't even know what he did. I thought he was a drug dealer. What year was that? What <laughs> Literally. Year? I mean, there's, people don't know what that is. So you're like, I don't know how this fucking guy lives his life. He says he does real estate, but I don't know. He's making money. He's, he's making money. And, and I'm like, and he's saying stuff to me that doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> but he was wholesaling and short selling. Yeah. And this is like 2010. 2010. Okay. After 2008 crash, market was starting to yeah. rebound. <laughs> You back in in the saddle. You're doing construction. You're starting to learn the real estate game on the. I'm not. Yeah, I'm learning on the construction side. Yeah, you're learning on the construction side. You meet somebody that's wholesaling. <laughs> He's making good money. I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah, he just says he does real estate. So I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he was making good money. Yeah, yeah. he's like, they had the Rolex on. He had the nice Hummer H2. He had yeah. all of it. Man, he had the house. He was young. I was like, dude, what do you do? Yeah, this is before social media, like Instagram and stuff, was popping. You know. Yeah. He was doing it old school. Yeah. So that got you interested more on, on the investing side, right? Yeah. Kind of what it is. He pushed me off into at the gym. He was like, hearing me complain about it. I was like, dude, I just want to do something more. And he's like, why don't you build homes? Like you already have the construction experience. And the reason going he, back, he gave you that idea. He gave me that he idea. Said, hey, why don't you build homes based on your construction? Yeah. He's like, you know how to do all of it. Why don't you start your own company and do it? And he said to me at the time, he said, I'll partner with you and do it. Well, of course he's a real estate investor. He's a shark. He knows what he's doing. He's like, this guy's got all the experience in the world. I'll work with him and we'll do it. Um, and so I was like, awesome. This is an exit. Let's do it. And so I was like, okay, all right. I went to my dad and I was like, hey, dad, I'm going to start building. And I have a friend of mine from the gym. My dad doesn't know him. Um, that's going to partner with me on this and thing and whatnot. And my dad, my dad's an honest guy. My dad's an awesome guy. Um, he goes, I tell you what, I like the optimism. I like you want to do this. Why don't you partner with me on your first deal instead of this random guy? that you don't know if he's going to screw you over or not. I'm going to treat you fair. You know, I'm your dad. I'll partner with you on this deal. And basically all he did was co-sign for the lot. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's like, I'll partner with you on the deal. I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of the construction because I have 
obviously more experienced than you. And, uh, you know, then you can go from there. And I was like, that sounds like a solid deal. So my buddy wasn't offended at all. He was like, oh yeah, it makes sense, buddy. But he, he's the one that pushed me off my friend. Yeah. And so I proposed, I was telling my dad, Hey, I'm partnered with this guy, let's go, dude. And the other guy, and my dad's like, I'll, I'll co-sign the loan instead. That was honorable of your dad to, Big time. to do that for you. Big time. Are y'all still close today? My dad? Yeah. 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 We have different views of business and stuff, sure. but we, uh, yeah. Of yeah. Course me and my dad. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get that point. Yeah. 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 So that's awesome. So he helped you with your, with your first lot. Yeah. Yeah. He helped me bank it essentially. Otherwise they weren't going to give me money. Right. Yeah. And you built it. Yeah, I did all the construction. So I was still working for him. And then after hours or during lunch, since I was working for him, I was doing some project management. I would go to these jobs. I'd take, you know, I was running around. He has projects all over the city doing concrete yeah. work. And so I was, I was checking on my job in between or on the weekends. Nice. So I made sure I delegated the time. So you learned the whole construction process and went from architectural plans, lot, slab, uh, pl well, plumbing, slab, framing, all everything. Up, and you learned everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah. And I was doing basement houses at the time. Yep. And then you, you end up selling that house. I'm assuming you made some money in so that first, first house. the first spec house I built, I made 45 grand. Nice. And I remember, and it took me like nine, 10 months to build. Yep. Uh, and I was there every day, like because you as much as I could when I after part hours. Time. Yeah, I was working part time for my That's dad. That's why still. it took you so long. It took me a long time. Yeah. yeah. Well, and just lack of skill and understanding mm -hmm. and coordinating subs yep. while I was still working. And, yep. and it was a decent sized house. It was an infill lot in a nice neighborhood. Yeah. Because that's all I was acclimated to was like nicer builds and some newer stuff. So I didn't yep. go build something small. I mean, it yep. was affordable for the time. What, what, what was the rep? You know, because my wife is about to get her GC license. Mm -hmm. we, we, that's the only thing we don't do in real estate is new build construction. What were some of the things that you can tell the audience that, uh, you know, maybe that can help them if they're looking to get their GC Good license? And you see a lot of this is another thing. You go attack influencers. I'll attack a little bit on this one because yeah. people talk about like you can just jump into new construction. Yeah. But people really, really, really need to understand their market. So you see some people talking about how they're going to make half a million dollars on this spec house. And, and I'll tell you why I have the, the experience for it or how they make millions of dollars in building these high-end homes. If you do not have another exit strategy, if you don't understand real estate investing first, then you're building a massive liability. It's why it's called a speculative investment. It's basically a gamble. It's a hope and a prayer that you're going to sell this thing and you're going to make this money. And I had to learn that lesson the hard way. We'll get into it. So boom, build this house. Make 45 grand when I sell it. I'm like, holy, holy shit. Yeah. Dude, that's, more than I make, that's more than I was making per the whole year of working for my dad. My dad paid me like less than 50 bucks an hour. He ain't trying to move me up at the company here. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm, like, I'm like, oh my God, this is how money's made. Like my whole mindset, my whole life shifted. You got a taste of it. I got a taste of it. I was like, that's how people can get rich. I was yeah. like, sick. So what did I do? I was like, I'm going to do some more. <laughs> so I go and then I got a couple more. I ended up selling a lot. I didn't end up building on it. Somebody was like, I want to have my dad build my home. Would you sell us the lot? I was like, sure. Marked it up 25 grand, sold a lot. I was like, did nothing, made 25 grand. Still didn't click to me though about like I could do that more. It didn't click to me. I was like, oh, I just need to go build more houses. That was, that was all luck. So I didn't even think about that being you a business. You didn't think through any problems that could happen? Nothing. I think I'm that, like, I should go build again. Yeah. I think that happens with a lot of people and as entrepreneurs. I know it for me is that you start making a little bit of money, like, oh, you just make money, nothing bad happens. Yeah. Well, you don't even know what can happen. That's right. I didn't you even don't know. know. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, correct. And my and at this point, I mean, my dad's like I said, helped me, uh, guided me, but my dad's not an investor. My, my dad's a construction guy too, so he's not saying, well, you could do this, you could do that. He's just he's he's just you know, be cautious. Builders go bankrupt if you do build too many kind of mentality. He's not saying you need to learn about you know rental properties. You need to learn about investing. You need to learn about lending. No, 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 no. We're construction people. Like we're blue collar people. That's, that's what we knew. Yep. And we know he knows more about the structural integrity of this house. What kind of LVLs you got on this thing. He knows more about the foundation, how many pieces of rebar need to be in there. What kind of mud you got to order for the foundation. The technicals. That's the tech. That's what we, yeah. I grew up doing. Yep. And I, I, that doesn't, I didn't know anything about the money side. I didn't know anything about the business side. So, um, so I, I go, I go and build uh, that one. I sell a lot and make the 25 grand. I build my third one and it sits. It sits, it sits, it sits for a couple months and still just enough for me to shit my pants. Cause I don't know what the heck's going to happen. And I was taking the money that I had gotten and having to put it into the next deal in order to get out of the grasp of having a somebody co-sign, right? Like they, we need, the bank kept needing me to put money into the deal or me to purchase the lot and pay down the lot in order to give me more money. So I was like, just thought how it was done. So I took the money and dumped it into the next lot, took the money, dumped it in the next lot, pay to play. I kept put rolling your money. Yeah. 
And, uh, well, this one didn't sell as fast and I ended up making like 20 grand when I sold it. Still glad I learned a lesson, made 20 grand, but I was like, oh, it's not always $45,000 yeah. plus, you know? And so I, I kind of got a little bit of like, okay, I understand. Well, during the process of building these three home or two homes in the one lot, I had, uh, when I was advertising them, I would have some people come up to me and say, can you build this home in our neighborhood? Can you build this home on our lot? We have two acres out in town. And so I started to create relationships and started custom home building. And this so is, that's what I your, did next. This is where your custom home building career mm -hmm. started. That's correct. But you cut your teeth on some specs first. That's how I got my name out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. You started doing custom home building. How did, how long did you do that for? Yeah, uh, up until 2021. Wow. Okay. So a, a good 10 year run. Yeah. Okay. So what, what was that like, you know, for people that want to become a custom home builder? Cause I've heard, I've heard horror stories on one side. I've heard, well, you gotta be careful. You gotta do it the right way. Cause yeah. it, you know, it, it I think the you gotta good, be careful and do it the right way. Um, and I think that it depends on your personality. Yeah. If you're in it, first of all, real estate investors, in my mind, you're in it for freedom. You're in it for money. You're in it to live your life by your design and mm -hmm. to do your thing. Custom home builders, if you like the design work, if you like building, my father's one of those people. He enjoys that. He doesn't, he doesn't care as much about the vacation or the cars or the, or the house or the time even. He likes the process. He loves the process. He's an engineer by trade. Like He loves talking about technical stuff. He loves the creativity that comes of it. He loves the credibility he gets mm -hmm. from building this thing yep. more than he loves the money. And so... Um, it depends. So if you, of course that would be something, if you really like to build things and to do that, then that's a personal choice. But if it were talking strictly about money, monetarily growing a business, it's not a scalable business. It's not a growable business it's not in, a in most business. markets in most yeah. places, right? Yeah. Unless you're building $14 million houses in Fort Lauderdale, you know, then you're building custom homes or $50 million houses. Yeah, in or Boca maybe Raton. a DR Horton, the big billionaire. Or you go back and you do that. That's not a custom home. That's spec homes. That's total spec homes. Yeah. So yep. you kind of have to, which way are you going to go? And a lot yep. of people fall in the middle, especially in like the Midwest and the South. Mm. Like you have the, the mass builder that's building tons and developing. And they're really only selling houses because they're wanting, trying to push dirt. They're trying to sell their, la their land that they bought yeah. 10 years ago and they're making their margin on the land. They're just selling the houses for a small margin and then they're making it up on the sale with the real estate company that they own that's an agent. Yeah. Like, that's how they make their money. They don't make any house. money on building the fucking house. That's what people don't realize. Like they may break even, but that's fine because they're going to freaking have a mortgage company. They're going to have a real estate company that, owns, that, does the, that, that sells the property and then they have the dirt company that d did that. So guys, this is real important what he just said. That's called vertical integration, mm -hmm. right? And you have to start thinking like this as an entrepreneur. I think a lot like this when I do stuff, right? We were talking about a lot of the stuff that I do and yeah. how it's all tied together. And being a one trick pony in real estate doesn't work. Oh no, I'll tell you what happened. So I, 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 was, go, I, was, I was building customs. Thank, honestly, thank God for customs at the time because they kept me alive. Um, I would get a few customs and the way I did them, the way I was taught from old dudes and, and smart old school builders is cost plus this, the person building the home carries the loan. Mm -hmm. So you would carry your loan. I'd build your home for you and your wife. You guys would get the loan and then I would be a signer on the account. I would request draws. Once you approve them, the bank would fund the draws. I would pay the subs and I was cost plus. And so I'd cost plus anywhere from 10 to 15%. Now that 10 to 15% is my technically gross margin of actual gross would be the whole property but really my net is not net because i still have to pay my insurance my fuel my taxes my everything that comes out of that 15 10 to 15 percent and so but the good thing about them at this time in my life this timeline is that they're consistent income and when you're expect home builder only you don't have consistent income you have lump sums of hopes and prayers right for the most part <laughs> i mean just that's, the truth that's yeah that that's the truth it's truth so when you're killing it, you're killing it. And then what people tend to do when they're killing it is dump more money into the machine. And sometimes the machine stops just like wholesale. We talked about it earlier. Yep. yep. <laughs> and the music stops. And if you got if the music stops with your machine, the money in the machine, then you ain't got no fucking money. Yep. So anyways, I, uh, I'm custom home building. I'm getting a few clients here and there. So I'm doing okay. I'm maybe, you know, I'm still making a hundred grand, a couple hundred grand just from the commission or just from the cost plus percentages over the period of the year. I'm working really hard for that money because I'm building ground up homes for people. I'm getting plans done. I'm doing all of this stuff, working my ass off. I'm running around. And this is the same time I have fast forwarded a little bit, guys. But like throughout that process, I got married. I had two kids. They're 13 months apart. My wife quit her job and started helping me with books. And then I was got this bold idea. I think I was watching Grant Cardone. It was like, you know, think bigger, do bigger. And I didn't understand what that meant. So I applied it to what I do. I was like, hell yeah. 
I'm going to do two big spec houses. And so I built two $1 million houses in Oklahoma. And and these are like 5,000 square foot houses. One was in a show that was called the Street of Dreams. It's a really high end, like luxury block that you get, uh, that the neighborhood developer makes. And you can do like all the bells and whistles. Um, I did that one with a partner because I was like, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to diversify this. Did that one with a partner. And then I did the other one and I put it in the parade of homes. And so I put these two big bastards in the same neighborhood, ball and neighborhood like this house is in. And, uh, and I built them up and did all the stuff, like basically like your house, like we're in and the whole nine yards, designers, architect for it, the show. And, and then I had my personal residence too, that I'd already built. Well, these two aren't selling fast enough and I'm carrying the loans on both of these. What year is this? This is 2018. And so it's not fast. It's not, it's just not slow, but it's not fast. Mm-hmm. It's sticky. And all I know is how to build. All I know is how to build a home and sell a home or do a custom. And my thought in my head at the time, because education is important, this is why I preach it all the time to people. I'm like, you got to know more in, a, in order to understand how to make this work. I only understood sell specs to make money. And then the specs that are out there, people will see the product as an advertisement and maybe I'll get a custom. That was it. That was my thought process. And, it, and the numbers that I did on the homes that I was building, I was, I was on the best side, which is with how we tend to analyze our our high in the sky investments when we're young on the best side, I was going to make $200,000 from each property. And I was like, fuck yes, I'm going to be rich. This is going to be insane. I'm going to build these homes. I'm going to make 200 on this one, 200 on this one. I'm going to, this is the most amount of money I'll make this year. Plus I have some customs from it. What can go wrong? Well, they just set longer. And when they set longer and you have that price range of home with interest only loans that keep accruing, that keep accruing, that keep accruing. And then you have, changes that people want to do to them if they're going to make them so you're trying to negotiate you have to cut bait at a certain point point. and so i put my personal house up for sale i was like fuck it i gotta figure this out because now i'm stretching real thin because now i'm only floating these loans through my cost plus jobs so i'm literally making almost nothing you and don't, still feeding my family and if you don't keep building more homes to cover your losses <laughs> yeah and i couldn't because the bank ain't gonna give me more money you're, you're tapped out, I'm of, too the tapped bank. out of the bank yeah. yeah i don't know anything about private money or partners or anything like that yeah. i only had this partner that's one house yeah so I, I'm at a, I'm at, I'm having to do something. And that's where the lesson came in for me to like, I need to know more. more I don't know something here. I don't, there's, this can't be a way to get rich. Like it punched me in the face. Like this cannot be like, and I even played it out later in my life. I was like, okay, so what if I would have sold those two? What would, what would happen? Oh, what anybody else would do is I would go do some more until the music stopped. Yeah. They have musical chairs. Yeah. That's the way most people run business. They play musical chairs until the music stops. And they're like, oh, I don't know what happened. Yeah. And I was glad I learned this lesson, survived it. No big deal. It was the most stressful time of our, our, our life financially. Yep. Of course, I put the, my house up for sale. I have these two monster specs. I'm doing a few customs at the time to keep the, you know, a little bit of the dust going. Yep. And well, which one sells first? The one I'm living in. Because <laughs> it's a lower priced house. Of course. So I was like, babe, we're moving. Here we go. So I sell my primary residence. Thank God I make about $106,000. Uh, I did. You thought I would be ecstatic about it. I was just like, I needed it. <laughs> You're covering your losses. I needed it. Yeah. So we move into one of the specs. And then the other one, my partner and I get an offer on. And we're like, take it. Take it and run. And I, it was good that I sold my home. Because when we took it and run, I had to write. Between the both of, both of us, we wrote a 60 something thousand dollar check at the closing table to get rid of it. Wow. So I had to pony up 30 something thousand dollars. Yep. So it was a good thing I sold my home because I didn't have 30 fucking thousand dollars. Yep. And so, boom, move into the other spec. This one's off the books. I'm out 30 G's, whatever. Let's get on, move with our life and, and take your losses and ter- learn your lessons. Learn from your lessons, guys. When you have lessons like this, learn from them. That's huge. Um, and so, boom, I'm living in this one. I'm like, we're not going to, we can't, this isn't really a house we can afford. We shouldn't be in this big of a home. It's not what we need to be. And from the outside looking in, we're balling out. I still had the cars. I still had lots of toys. I had little babies. And we're living in this massive house that I had in the parade. And so, and that's what happens to a lot of builders. You guys that are like see them, the builders, you think they're ballers, but a lot of times they're just, yeah. they're just moving project to project. So I love this because there's a lot of lessons that we can talk about in here. And um, one, you just said, you know, learn from your, your lessons. But we're going we're to talk about some of these lessons. And, and in real estate, 
you said something too. You said you need to know more skills. And that's the truth in real estate. Real estate is so dynamic. There's so many ways to make money yes. in real estate. So people get convoluted with a lot. Yes. Of and they think, well, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have too many things. No, dude, listen, if you're not splitting atoms and you're not flying to the moon. Like, dude, this is all in the same wheelhouse. You can be a realtor and an investor. You can wholesale and you can flip. Correct. You can buy and hold and still be a builder. You can buy mobile home parks and, and do Airbnbs. It's all real estate. True. And I watched this the last cycle when everything pulled back in 2022. All the guys that I that I know that were influencers and coaches, they all went out of business. These are one trick ponies. Yeah. And and I was I told my wife, I said, the reason we still in business is because we got our hands in all kinds of stuff and we're diversified. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the lessons that I wanted you guys to hear that are listening to this from him on just being a builder. But that is a badass skill set to have. It is. If you use it in the right way. Right way. But if you, if you mixed up being able to do, say, direct to sell a marketer, raising private money. It's a totally different world. And being a builder. Totally different world. It adds to that, that yeah. ammunition. Yep. A hundred percent. And that's what we'll end up doing. Like now that we're out where we're at, we can get yeah. into that, but we'll end up taking that all of our skill sets together and multiplying it in a more affluent market like yeah. Southern California. A absolutely. So, you know, I mean, I've done commercial, I've done remodel commercial, I've done ground up commercial. So yeah, commercial, you know, you can start yeah. building a new build construction on the commercial side, uh, development. Mm -hmm. Did you understand construction? Yeah, I understood development. development too, because a lot of times I was developing, sometimes when people have acreage. And so you basically a mini development when you have to get any sewer lines out there, when you have to do septic, whatever you have to do. Or any, any extensions of neighborhoods. Yeah. yeah. You moved to California. That's recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's recent. recent. Just yeah. this year. Yeah. And so, you, so but to backtrack on the story real quick is like, I realized at that point that I needed to understand like debt. I needed to understand money, yeah. what you just covered. I really needed to understand like real estate investing. And so I, I, wanna, I don't want to leave this out because too many times, I mean, you're a coach. I'm a coach. Yeah. And people have fear about dumping money into coaches or educational people, which is kind of why you say what you say about some of these influencers, these yeah. fucking liars, some yeah. of them. And the truth is like I did, I invested. How was I going to learn anything? That's what I asked myself. There's no college for real estate investing. My dad's not going to be able to provide me with any more information. My buddy that's a real estate investor doesn't have time to sit me down and walk me through this whole process to do what he's doing. He would want to hire me. Yeah. I don't want to work for him. And so I was like, how do I learn this? It, it, not, not one, do you think one book was going to teach me all of this or one podcast, you know, or forum? No. So I invested $52,000, my wife and I, $52,000. This is at the same time, Chris. We didn't have the money. I just walked you through my financials yep. at the time. I, I had two credit cards because I had, had a building company. So I had some decent lines of credit. Um, and I put it on two credit cards and then we started paying it down and I had some toys that I'd accumulated like a, like a Chevelle. I had a, so a motorcycle, some stuff that I knew I could just peel off because I, that's how much I was willing to put up because yeah. I knew how much I needed to learn. Right. And it was a, it was a maturity lesson for me. And I had two kids and I had a wife and I'm like, are we going to take this to the next level? Or are you still going to play smaller baller? And so I was like, let's figure it out. And I'm not, I can't go to college for it. So I invest $52,000 into a two year program where I'd fly out. My wife and I both would fly out. I brought her along with me. I brought her along with me. I didn't do it alone. We did this together because we were that. going through this together. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what kept us together through this. That's a superpower. Later on, bro, she told me like, this was the most stressful time of her life and she didn't show it. But like, you got to think from a woman's perspective, yeah. two babies that were two and three, 13 months apart, husband just built in this nice house, then moves them to the next one. And then they can barely make payments on anything. Is like, she was ate up with stress. Of course, yeah. all levels to the roof, trying to figure it all out. She just quit her job. What am I doing? You know, she'd rather have been in a mobile home paid off at the point, at that point, just to yeah. live. So, um, I say all that because I invested, we invested the 52, we did the freaking two year program where I was still doing customs. Now I ditched these dead weights. I turned around and sold this one, sold the house I was living in. We ended up renting a property, uh, and, and just lowered our, our, our total expenses. We just leased a nice little property, um, and then started building another one for ourselves because we still build. That's how we made money. And then... Um, once we would go, we would go fly out to these classes, these little seminars once a quarter, and we would be there whole weekend writing notes down, reading books and listening and asking this investor that was teaching us, um, this course, you know, yep. program, and we would go back and apply it. And so during that period, we'd accumulated a few more rentals. We'd done a little flips too. So we were starting to diversify. diversify. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I took a flip that, or, um, you know, a rental property that I had that I couldn't, that was vacant and I turned it into a contract for deed. Well, how did I do that? I was literally in a contract for deed class less than two months ago. Yep. And I learned what that was. That's a tool. And I applied toolbox. it. Yep. And so once I have learned it and I applied it, 
I understood it a little yeah. more and I made money on it instead of a loss because yeah. of that one piece of information I got yeah. from that class. What he's talking about is very similar. It would be no different than if he was going to war and all he had was a machete. That's a thousand percent the same scenario. You don't have enough tools to fight the war and business is war. It is. You got to have tools. You got to have skills. You got to have knowledge. But why do people, so many people think that, uh, we, once we get out of high school or once we get out, they get out of college that they're, that they're done with education. I think yeah. the education is just beginning. Just, just starting. That's exactly right. I love this. So one, give me, give me something you, how did the, how did the Marine Corps help you with being in handling pressure, stress, and being just an, an entrepreneur and a builder? Yeah, good, good question. And, and the guy that told me to step off and to, to own, start my own construction company, the guy from the gym, mm-hmm. he said to me, and I was fearful. So for all of you that are thinking about getting into something or quitting your job or doing something, this was huge for me because I had the same fears. I had nothing to lose, really. Yeah. But I was scared still. I was scared. I wasn't even married at the time yet. If we were winding right back that far, um, I was about to get married, but... My point is, he told me, he's like, dude, didn't you just get back from Iraq like three or four years ago? I was like, yeah. Or like two years ago at that time. He's like, yeah. I was like, yeah. And he was like, what's the worst case that's going to happen? And I was like, he knew I had good parents. He knew I had, you know, a brain in my head. You know, I had, I was, I was there. I was an able-bodied person that was driven because I was at the gym with him all the time. Yeah. He's like, what's the worst case going to happen? He's like, no, literally play it out. And I was like... Well, I guess worst case that happened is I have to live with my parents for a short period of time, rent an apartment, move my new girl into my apartment. I didn't have kids yet. And I guess that's it. And he was like, so what the fuck are you waiting for? Yeah. You didn't get blown up like two years ago, but you won't take a risk on starting your business. And I was like, he's basically telling me, shut the fuck up and do something about it, but don't complain about it here at the gym anymore. Yeah. Cause he was an entrepreneur already. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. and that, what I want to say is like, that was I use that to reach back into my brain all the time when I was going through all the financial trouble or going through these growth periods, I'll call them things that I needed to learn. It's like, what's really the worst case scenario. And most of the time, most people, most of you guys watching this, most of us humans are more scared of what other people will think of us and the fear of if Chris tries really hard and he goes bankrupt or the market shifts and this happens. They're more, more worried about that than we really are. Cause I, I, I'm a guy just like you. I'm like, We could probably live in an apartment with yeah. a cool car and, that's paid off and, and be fine. That's right. And guess what? Who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck? You're not going to die. And it made me think when you were talking about that, I say a lot of stoicism. One of the great uh, stoic philosophers says, it's good to go and run that scenario in your head because what you're doing is decatastrophizing. Because if you run it in, because you, I do this all the time naturally, when I get into a business venture, I run all the bad scenarios, every single scenario that happened. That way, if I get to that point, it, and I, that does it's not happen. shocking. That's right. It's, the shock effect is gone because I decatastrophize. I've been there in my mind, but guess Good what? Point. It never happens hardly. <laughs> no. We always are our own worst yeah. critics, our own worst sabotages of our success because we play the worst case scenario. Yeah, no, because you're exactly right. Look at my scenario. He told me that like three or four years before, three or four years later, I'm going through my worst financial situation because I had pushed it. I, would, I had done, started my own company yeah. and it still never went back to the point where I had to move into my parents because I figured it out Yep. because yeah. I knew that I wouldn't stop. And, and that's what happens most of the time. We figured out as entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And the cool thing about going through hard times like that is you build that mental muscle they're the lessons i needed to learn yeah i mean in order to get to the next level how else was i going to learn that lesson yeah well you and you handle stress a lot better after being in a stressful situation just it's like not what is stressful the marine? anymore that's right? right exactly so that's what boot camp's about what is the, exactly that's this all is, boot camp is about boot camp is about trying to stress you out to the max so that it's, you're not you're make acclimated you to chaos correct make you quit and that's what you guys understand that are watching this they're entrepreneurs the entrepreneurial gods will test you hundred percent. And they test you with financial pain, All the emotional time. pain. It may not be physical pain, but it still hurts like a mofo. Oh, yeah, I think it hurts worse. Yeah, Way it does. Because it, it's, it, it's so lasting. It is. It, it doesn't stop. Yeah. And I've been in situations where the anxiety is so bad. I've lost, you know, 20 pounds, can't sleep, can't eat. Oh, no, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. That, I've been in, I've been there. I have it, three in the morning. I cannot sleep. I'm waking up. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the credit cards. I'm looking at the bills yeah. coming in. I'm like, how, what am I going to do? How am I going to sell this? Yeah. I mean, I, I was there for yeah. sure. For sure. But you know what? It made me a better entrepreneur. Absolutely. Well, how, how yeah. would we expect to become a good 
leader, a good entrepreneur, make more money without having these experiences. I mean, it's just idiotic to almost think about it in reverse. Yeah, it, you know? it's part of the journey. I think a lot of people that get into entrepreneurship, real estate investing, they want to skip that journey of, of the hardness. Yeah, and it's of, not over either. You're yeah. going to go through something in the no. future that's going to be hard. That's right. I'm going to go through something in the future that's going to be harder than what I've ever yeah. done in order to do what I've never done. Yeah, and I'm going to have more skills when I confront that situation. doesn't mean it's going to not be hard, but I'll be more experienced. I'll be more of an experienced me, and I, it it will be less painful depending on how big of a barrier you want to confront. Because I think as entrepreneurs, you're never going to quit. I'm never going to quit. As soon as I get to one um, goal, I I create another yardstick and I slide that yardstick. (laughs) Every time. Yeah. Every time. I did that. Well, shit, I didn't think I could do that. Let's see if how far I can take this. Yeah. Oh, now I'm bored. (laughs) Now I got to keep going. Yeah. So I'm telling you this because the anxiety never goes away, folks. But once you realize that, once you realize that, I honestly, it feels like, I got less anxiety from it because it's like, I know, I know that I'm going to, no matter what, if I got to this, there's no end all. There's no like, yeah. oh, well, I have this now. Now I'm set. I need to just preserve. Because what happens if you do that is you're going to crumble. Like you start to go backwards. So you always need to be on the offense moving forward. Yeah. And you got to know when to play offense and know when to play defense. Sure, too. sure. Know, we're probably more in a defensive mode for the past two years because things, you know, we're since 22. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're sitting with interest rates, everything. Yeah, insurance went up. I mean, we we got kicked in the balls like everybody else did, yeah. and it's just a matter of um, adapting and changing. I mean, y'all probably talk mm-hmm. about that in the military yeah, all improvise, the time. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. Improvise, improvise adapt, and, adapt overcome. Adapt and overcome. Yep, it is yep. my motto. Is the Marine Corps motto it is amazing, and and you can use that in business. You can. That is. You can use that in anything. Anything. Yeah. Because you said war is chaos, business is chaos too. You know, yep. and and, I'm, and and that's why, guys. That's why I bring military guys here because there's so many correlations to business, and and I think. You guys, I say you guys, people that want to be an entrepreneur are shortchanging themselves or bullshitting themselves on how hard this shit is. 100%. I was just hanging out with two Navy SEALs last weekend. You know them. One of them is TKEV. Yep. And then another one of them is friends, Ryan. And Ryan's been an entrepreneur since he got out of the teams. And he was actually one of TKEV's instructors. And he's like, entrepreneurship, 10 times harder than when I was a Navy SEAL. Yep. 10 times. And that's true. I mean, it's 10 times harder than being a guy in the military. I mean, I tell people this, honestly, once I got in the military, like being in Iraq was the easiest time of my life. I didn't yeah. only had to think about one thing. Yeah. You, you can't be a soft pussy and be an entrepreneur, a successful no. entrepreneur. Correct. Correct. It is fucking brutal. You yep. deal, you have to have so, the thing is you have to have so many skill sets. You have to better deal with people. You have to you know, deal with stress, uh, cash flow management. Yep. Um, yeah, family at the same time. So much. So much stuff. It, it requires so much of you. It is, it is some of the most, you know, terrifying moments in my life, but also some of the most rewarding at the same time. Yep. And, you know, it, it's good that you come on here and, and, and talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of, you know, what it took for you to become a custom home builder, what that looked like. And I'm sure, sure it gave you a good life. You made money. You did, I did well. I got to a point where I was doing really well. Like I said, I did my last custom in 2021 with my, yeah. I did it with that partner. I just yeah. I started doing a little more customs with my partner because it allowed me to spend a little more time with my investments that I was yeah. learning about. And so I started building my assets. I started doing investments and I was still partnering on some of the customs. Um, and then eventually I got to a point where in 2020, the custom home building, I already didn't enjoy it. You know, I already didn't enjoy it. And this is something I want people to ask themselves too, is like, what's the goal? What, what is, what, why are you doing what you're doing? And I had to ask myself that too, because in my mind I was selling my soul to get to a monetary value. So one day I can live the life I want. And I realized like through this, through 2020, like I, I was just still custom home building and I didn't enjoy it anymore. I was getting beat up by clients. I couldn't get commodities. I couldn't get people lumber prices. We didn't know what things were going to be the next day. Um, homeowners still had money because there was so much money in the economy. They wanted custom homes. I couldn't tell them when their dishwasher is going to show up. Oh, you want a Mila? I don't know if you're going to get the product. You can't match it with the stove. And so I was like, F this. It's my time to get out. I've invested my money into learning real estate investing. It's time for me to parlay that into there. So I, my wife started doing some wholesale deals. She got her license. So she was kind of going over here, beta testing it, yep. getting, our, getting our feet wet. We didn't just go cold turkey one day, stopped income, started income. More skills. More skills. You just lay, you're layering on I'm the layering skills. layering on the skills. And then I'm slowly pulling back and then we're not taking on any more customs. And so me and my partner kind of agreed, like, we're just going to finish yep. the ones we have on the books and we'll move on. And he went back to building on his own and I was going to just bounce. 
And so that's what we did. And full transition in 2021, we went all in on full-blown real estate investing. And I, in between that time period where I had invested in the court, the programs and stuff, I was accumulating rentals, yep. some here and there, doing a few yep. fix and flips. And so I just went now, I was like, okay, it's time to shift. Because there was a point that I, I had done a remodel for some friends in our neighborhood because people knew who I was. I had a pretty big brand. I was on the board of directors, Central Oklahoma Home Builders Association. I was on the board of directors wow. as a builder. I was one of the youngest members and uh, because I grew up in the building community and they knew me and they knew my dad, they knew who, how, what knowledge I brought to the table, um, my reputation. Mm-hmm. And so what, what my wife, I think she did like a wholesale deal and she did like 25 grand on this wholesale deal. It may have been a whole tail deal because we took it down. We didn't know we yeah. even had to sign, right? Like yeah. we took it down and then we sold it and she made like $25,000 on the remodel that I was doing. I was going to make less for the next nine months being cost plus on this $300,000 remodel. Yep. And I was like, and I was li- and now you're li- I'm liable for it too forever. Cause right. I'm warrantying it. I'm doing all yep. the things. I coordinated freaking hundreds yep. of trades in these people's homes. And I was like, that, that is pissing me off. I'm and that, out. And there's a lesson right there. Your risk of time mm-hmm. and, and versus profit. And this was the second time I learned this lesson. Yeah. This is the first time I learned this lesson, Chris, get this. That house I told you about that I sold with my partner that we had to pay 30 grand a piece in. Mm-hmm. The, you know what the realtor walked off with on that day? $45,000 and I paid $30,000. My partner paid $30,000. She made forty five. dollars yep. And I was like, we took all this liability, took all this risk. We spent all this time. We built all this. We met the plan designer here. We met the trim carpenter here. We met the foundation guy here. I mean, I worked through so many problems. I yep. took on all this liability to pay thirty grand, yep. and she walked off after her 15 or 20 days or whatever it was listing the property and made more money than us. See, this is the lesson that I want you guys to hear because, you know, I told you earlier, Patty's getting her GC license, but it's not to build specs and it's not to build custom houses. It's exactly. to yeah. build my own product. A hundred percent way to That do I'm going to keep my own Airbnbs on the beach, my own developments, my own strip centers and malls. Yep. Because I know how to find deals off market. So I'm capturing equity on the front end. I know how to raise private capital. So I'm dealing with the banks. Yep. Patty will know how to build it. So I'm going to add some equity from the builder's cost, I'm, I'm take that cost out. All yeah. I'm doing is taking middleman out. 100%. I'm taking the middleman out of everything. That's the only way. That's that. That's the way I would do it now. Yeah. Like the only way I would do it. Same. Yep. Yeah. Man, this is a lot of. I got a lot of value out of this. Uh, we're coming up on the hour. Sure. Um, so, tell us. You know, what what does it look like? What do you for the next five, 10 years, what, what are you looking to do? Awesome. Good question. So recently we just moved to Southern California. So we moved, we just picked up, uh, uh, Alicia and I started doing well in real estate. I mean, we started accumulating, chomping it down. Um, you and I joked a little bit about making some mistakes, like what we all have in, you know, we scaled up, we had the office, I had a 3,300 square foot office. I remodeled it as a builder. It just seems to be like something that I just keep doing. I don't know why over building shit. Yeah. And so I had this badass office. I had these people in there and then I was like, fuck, I just created a prison. <laughs> and so anyways, we kind of scaled the people down, the team down. And then we really went all in and just taking property down, accumulated a large portfolio and since 21 Wait, to now. You don't believe in scale, 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 big team. No, it's all about overhead. net profit, man. Once you put in your pockets, it's the only thing that pays you. You know, it's the only thing that makes sense. You That's know? not with Instagram. Uh, That's not Instagram. Me. You got to scale. Dude, you're how many you're times? not cool if you don't scale. I made it real the other day it's, it, it, because it's such a joke. You know who's the worst about this? Freaking uh, mortgage brokers are the worst about this and so are real estate agents <laughs> we did 40 million this year i'm like yeah you did what'd you make freaking 0.2 percent of that 0.02 percent of that that's right you know seventy five thousand yeah. dollars. so yeah I, i'd much rather have a business that grosses a million and i net a half a million oh yeah than do 10 million and i made two hundred fifty thousand, or even a half a million even a half a million because you're working amount. 10 times harder to make that's it right. 10 Remember that I told you that guy that yeah. did $10 million in wholesale? He made zero, zero money in Marketing will eat you up. And I learned that lesson too. I yeah. learned that in wholesale. So I did things backwards. I did wholesale later on in my career. Um, I was a builder first, so I did fix and flips, buy and holds. And I was, I was bankable because I had such a construction reputation. So I was able to get lending pretty decent. And so I would just burr properties. I was just like a burr machine. I would start burn properties at volume. I started burn uh, contra- uh, seller finance deals. I'd buy a portfolio, renovate it. But I put new tenants in there, up the rents, refinance the whole portfolio off seller finance on a 30 year terms. And so that's what we did over the last four years. And then we were like, okay, what's next? And so I started educating people. I started jumping into the coaching thing because people were asking me how I was doing what I was doing. 
And uh, I really enjoy that. I enjoy yeah. helping other people. I yeah. enjoy building a brand. I enjoy putting myself out there. Uh, you and I talked a lot about yeah. that. Um, and so that's where we've really shifted our focus. And what we did was we decided like, you know what? Now that we've created this real estate company, let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's live where we want to live. Let's, let's, let's either sell our portfolio or keep some of it or decide what we're going to do. But let's, let's sell this big home we just built. We had our own custom home, 5,000 square foot. Everything we, I mean, I had planned to design this whole thing myself. Sold it, up and sold it. $1.3 million cash in Oklahoma. And we just bounced to California this last year. And we're like, fuck it. Because building another home in Oklahoma to me wasn't going to change my life is, is what, for what I wanted. Our goal was really to like experience life and go see. So we did it. And that was a huge growth thing for us. It's massive growth when you move like that. And so we did. We moved. Now we're out there. And the real estate market and the market in general in Southern California is popping. It's pretty yeah. good. Even in little times, like I don't get me wrong, like right now we are still in a lower time, yeah. but it is, there's still deals moving. There's a lot yeah. of influx of money, there's a lot more economy there. Still demand. It's a lot, there's, there's mm -hmm. a, it was a lot harder in Oklahoma, let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, Not as much inflow. A lot of people, the migration patterns are still good. Over mm -hmm. there. People are still moving there. That's correct. Yeah. To Southern California, yeah. Not yeah. much San Francisco or No, LA. no. That's what people are like, oh, everybody's moving out of California when they tell me, like, what are you doing yeah. moving in? And yeah. I'm like, it's, it depends on where you're at, for yeah. sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so the next five years, we're gonna. I've really focused on education and coaching and building my brand out, helping other people in, in all capacities, whether it was like you said, fitness, real estate, mindset, mindset construction, um, construction. Yeah, the whole the whole nine yards. Because I I essentially comprised my whole last fifteen years of experience, and I'm like, I started in the gym, I got myself right. I had because let's be honest, a lot of people want to skip the basic steps. Yeah. You're a good father. You're, 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 you're a good husband. We talk about this off camera. Those steps right there allowed you to focus on your business. And some people want to skip that step and they want to go get rich. Yep. And it doesn't work like that. It yeah. doesn't work like that. So I like to build the ground up and then educate people on how to make more money, get into real estate investing, build a brand, grow mindset. Um, and so I'm focused on that. But well, since we're, we've been in California for a little less than a year, in 2025, we'll start doing some deals out there. So I'll probably do some fix and flips. Eventually, I'll start accumulating property out there because the appreciation rate is yeah. insane compared. Yeah. I mean, insane. You could literally trip on equity if you just bought something now and waited 10 years. Yeah. And so what I'll do is probably start selling some of my properties off in Oklahoma. I'll start accumulating some assets in Cal Southern California. And then the appreciation, you know, add ADUs, we'll start growing that. We'll do some more social media content around that. Um, and then, you know, maybe even small commercial, things like that. Yeah. That's Help all. some people. That's it. Yep. Help. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love and that, then bring people out, you know, like you do, like we have people coming to our event in November and then I would be cool to be able to bring people out to walk them through some of the projects that we have going yeah. too. Yeah. There's a lot of lessons that you can learn from, you know, you've been doing construction since you were 16, you said? Yeah. I mean, since I was like 13, I was getting Thir picked up. 13. But I mean, so. I wasn't working full time, obviously, yeah. but the summers, you know, yeah. I would, I would do what I was, I was at yeah. my dad's shop. I was at the office. Right. But there's a lot of wisdom that you have extracted from doing this since you were 13 to you know, if, if I'm going to you know, hire a coach as a, for a contract or shit, I'm hiring you, you know, yeah. you know, 13, been doing it since he was 13. <laughs> I mean, you're 37 now yeah. you've been through the ringers of, you know, yeah. so I'm sure if you had to start over say with, and you extracting all this knowledge, you would have done a lot of things differently. A hundred percent. Well, well, let's go back to the contractor thing. Cause I think this is huge. We kind of talked about the influencer space with it, the builder side, like what you mentioned about what you guys are going to do. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. A lot of these guys, and, and uh, they're talking about how they can build these big specs and make half a million dollars and they can make a million dollars. You need to really look at your economy. You need to look at where you're at. Because I can tell you right now in Oklahoma City, I, you cannot. You cannot make a half a million dollar rip on a spec house in Oklahoma City. You can ask any builder or developer around there. They just doesn't have the economics. And most economies don't. I mean, can you make half a million dollars on building a property in Southern California? Maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Can you in certain areas of Houston and Dallas yeah. and yeah. maybe Scottsdale when it was booming? Probably yeah. so. But let's be realistic on what kind of margin you're going to make for the risk you're going to take on other building. You got to know your market. Correct. Yeah. That's so good. It's so true. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that you, because I got, you know, it reassured me that I don't, and, and Pat, I'm, because we talk about this all the time, that we don't want to build specs. We don't want to build custom homes. We want to build for ourselves, for our own equity, for our own future, for our own wealth. Well, what happens is you, you like this beautiful home you guys have redone, you know, it's, you could see what you do and you, so you get excited about it. Yeah. Um, and I've made a lot of money of building my own homes and selling them. Okay. But 
you have to take into consideration the sweat equity I put into the yeah. design and building that house too. So if I spend a year and a half building this thing, you know, and I make, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, then what is my real ROI if I were to just invest doing it in specifically in real estate investing? And so that's something that we learned really quickly. Yeah. And so, you know, where we're at, well, we lease our property. And then we focus all of our energy and our capital and making more money in real estate investing. It's a better allocation of our time. And I think a lot of people get emotional about their primary residence yeah. and they need to think of it a little differently. You just said the better allocation of your time. You guys got to start thinking in terms of return on your time, right? We talked about yeah, this. Because I, I joke around. I'm like, do you know how much time I spent yeah. on picking out a freaking four by four subway versus a subway tile? And we'd go back and forth to the granite store yeah. on which countertop we were going to put in our office. I literally like stay up at night talking to my wife. Well, what do you think about the color pattern for the home? This is our primary residence. Yeah. I, I sold the thing and now I'm like, I don't give a shit. That's right. But, but, but why do we care so much about that? And so yeah. you kind of start to get a little detached from this. And I think some of it's programming from the beginning on like feeling like we own something. But the reality yeah. is if you have any debt on the whole thing, or even if you pay taxes and insurance, yep. you don't really own anything. That's right. So it's just kind of you're sold that yeah. it, well, owning this and I have this one primary residence and I have to contract and hold on to this and I have a paid off Kia and this thing. And yeah. it's like, well, you, well where are you going to go with that? Yeah. Everything's for sale. Everything. Yeah, I love Everything. that you say that too. You're like, because most people will be like, I'm going to, I wish I would have held more properties and kept them for 1,400 yeah. years. That's bullshit. And Chris is like, nah, we're fucking selling anything with the right price. And I'm that's like, right. that's how I feel. Yeah. I'm not attached to it. Yeah. This house, somebody makes you right offer in this house. You guys will be out in two weeks. Yeah, you, you make me get enough offer for this house. I'm going, bro. I'm <laughs> exactly. going. Exactly. And I'm going to recycle into another asset. And I'm going to constantly recycle. What do, you tell, what do you tell people to say, well, Chris, I have a 2.9% interest rate and we love this area? Dude, listen. You take that 2.9 interest rate and you can roll it into a $200,000 profit or a $400,000 profit. You think, uh, what's going to impact your I'd life? I'd rather, more. yeah. What's going to change your life? Staying in this house and saving 500 bucks a month or a check for two to $400,000 at of equity in your house. Exactly. You guys got to start thinking smarter about this. Exactly. It, it's, it doesn't make any sense. If you can make a big rip. And a lot of people are sitting it. on money right they now. They are sitting on money. Because of the appreciation that's yeah. happened. Yeah. Well, and they don't want to, they don't want to retrade to a they're six, scared. a 6.5 interest rate or for sure they don't because they're going to downgrade. Now yeah. here's the deal. If they have a job and they're not trying to make more money, they're not trying yeah. to grow, then you should stay. Yeah. I would take know? I'd take that equity out and I'd ride the cycle because it's going to, it's going to come down again and then you buy low again. Yep. It's simple as that. But yep. no, this is real good, man. I, they gave me a lot of clarity. Uh, so Austin, where, where can they find you at? Instagram and YouTube, austin.hancock1. Those are the best ways to reach out yep. to me. If you want to reach out to me directly, it's Instagram. Um, and then you, my YouTube channel, I'm still, we're kicking it up. We're trying to post two times a week. So, yeah. Go follow Austin. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in construction, mindset, guy's a Marine. Look at him. He looks like a freaking warrior. Look, if I'm going to war, I'm taking this dude with me. <laughs> I want to be in a foxhole with That's Austin right. Hancock. Let's go, baby. So, Guys, I appreciate you watching. Give me a like. Give me a subscribe. Give me some comments, some shares. Um, if you're interested in, in learning about real estate, go to chrisreed.com. You want to come out to one of my masterminds, the Allies Mastermind. We do these things every other month at my house locally. If you're a local follower, Austin's actually here to speak tonight at my event. If you want to come to my big boy event, December 11th and 12th in Destin, Florida on the beach, that's where we're going to have... Uh, it's a two full day event. You can learn a lot of different aspects of real estate. So other than that, please follow me and B Big Mama Rude at Real Estate Rude and Chris Rude. And uh, just guys, just keep skilling up. That's all you got to know. If you keep skilling up and you don't quit, you're going to win. Peace.